Hi, I'm Dave Miklos. I'm here in the Hall of Human Origins at the DNA Learning Center of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. I'd like to welcome you to the first of our three-part series on what DNA says about our human family. In the first episode, I'm gonna take a look at our closest non-human relatives who are chimpanzees. In episode two, we'll expand and look at ancient relatives, including the ancient human called Neanderthal and the, the, the Denisovans. In part three, we'll look, come forward in time and look at some human populations, including hunter-gatherers, farmers, and horse people who made us who we are today. So let's get started on the first episode with our chimps, our nearest non-human relatives. I'm gonna start with a little quiz. I'm gonna show you some photos of chimpanzees from across their range which extends throughout the equatorial belt of Africa, from West Africa to Central Africa to East Africa. And I'd like you to look at those chimpanzees and see if you can tell me where in that range across the belt of Africa each chimpanzee comes from. Here's another. Here's another. And another. Now you may notice that they have some differences, but the question is, can you place it to a particular place on the map of Africa? Another, another, so the question is, where does each of those chimps live across its range? It's really a trick question because even primatologists, people who are experts in chimpanzees, cannot go to a chimp in the zoo and tell you where it was captured in the wild or its forebears. So for all intents and purposes, chimpanzees look identical to each other, except for natural variation. Now let's take a look at human populations here represented by this populated map. See if you can tell me where each of these human beings comes from on our map. Any ideas about where this person might come from? How about this woman? This young man, where does he come from? This young man. This man, where does he come from? And her? And him? How about her? And her? and also this person, and her, and him. We had representatives from most of the continents of this world. And if you were good, you would have recognized some different populations from Africa, Europe, and Asia. But the point is, human beings look rather diverse, and we can tell more or less where they come from by indicators, like the way they dress, the way they behave, maybe their skin color or hair texture. But we can guess where human beings might come from. But we can't guess where the chimpanzees come from. So at least on the surface, you might say that there's more variation in the physical appearance of human beings than of chimps. But the question is, how about their genetic diversity? How about the DNA, the DNA that is passed on from generation to generation? Which group of organisms, the chimps or the humans, is more genetically diverse? And if we wanted to figure that out, we could take a look at a bunch of 
chimps and humans in modern time represented by the ends of these pipe cleaners. We could sample them and we could sort of look at the changes in their DNA to see whether they're rather different, like this right side of the graph, or rather similar, like here. And the way we look at this lineage through time is here's an ancestor of all the people or organisms we're studying. In this case, it would be a common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. And then going through time, changes occur in the DNA molecule, which I'm showing here, changes like a shift from a blue to an orange here, or from a green to a blue here. Those are mutations that occur through time. And we could follow them and track them back through time or look forward in time to what we see as evidence today of how those organisms have changed. Now, here's an actual experiment that was done looking at a variable part of the DNA in over 800 humans and over 300 chimpanzees. I'm gonna show you how we do that experiment and we'll really replicate that today. But on that chart, the center of the tree is more or less in the middle here and then branching out from it are different mutations and changes that then have differentiated different living things represented by each point or end of the branch. And represented at the points or the end of those branches are these 800 humans and 300 chimpanzees. And the question is, where are the chimps and where are the humans? Now, the way that we can figure the, that out is to use DNA as kind of a clock. And the important things about this DNA clock is that mostly DNA is a very stable molecule and doesn't change too much. That's important because we need to pass on hereditary information from generation to generation. And it's important that I function physiologically and maybe even look sort of similar to my father and mother, but really important that I'm a human and I carry on the basic processes. However, Occasionally, mutations or changes occur in this DNA molecule that are then passed on through a lineage and through time. But the important thing to remember is, here's some key things about DNA mutations. First, they happen one at a time. In other words, one mutation may happen here, and then separated in time, another mutation may happen here. They're not happening at the same time. Secondly, the rate at which the mutations occur is more or less regular. In other words, let's imagine that a mutation happens, then there's a pause of lots and lots of time, and another mutation happens. And then with the same passage of time, a third and a fourth mutation occur. They're not happening like this. And the third thing is, the mutations accumulate over time. Sometimes they can sort of get repaired or sort of mutated over, but all things being equal, mutations accumulate one at a time at a regular pace through time. And the number of different mutations represents how closely or how distantly things are related. Things with relatively the same number of mutations are closely related and organisms with different numbers of mutations are more distantly related. Any questions from the audience at this point? Well, if we were going to do this experiment to look at people from around the world and chimpanzees from around the world and to determine which group is more genetically different, we'd have to get DNA from somewhere. Now this represents a cell. Each human or chimpanzee is composed of trillions of cells. They look more or less like this. And in your biology, of course, you st study that the main part of our DNA is stored in the nucleus here on these X-shaped uh, structures called chromosomes. 
But we're actually gonna look at DNA from another compartment of the cell, this one here. And those of you that are following along here or study biology, you might know the name of this structure. It is called the mitochondrion or in multiples, mitochondria. Well, a couple of things about mitochondria. They're the so-called powerhouses of the cell. So it's in the mitochondria that the chemical processes take place that generate the energy that each cell and each living thing needs to survive. There's lots of mitochondria per cell, thousands, and cells that require a lot of energy, such as your muscle or your nerve cells, have even more mitochondria in some cases. The interesting thing is that mitochondria have their own genome or their own set of DNA instructions. The DNA molecule of a mitochondrion is really small and it's actually shaped like a circle. Here's a diagram of it. it has only a few tens of genes on it or instructions for making proteins that do jobs. So it's a very small piece of DNA. It's shaped like a circle and here's an electron micrograph of what it actually looks like. Now, our main chromosomes in our nucleus are linear or lines, but the DNA that's contained in our mitochondria is circle-shaped. Now, this is interesting because it gives us a hint about where our mitochondria came from a long, long time ago. And in fact, our mitochondria were once free-living bacteria who then integrated and took up housekeeping with the progenitor of our cells. So essentially living within each one of our cells are remnants of bacteria that are especially good at making energy. And they maintained a bit of their own DNA and it's circular. This is an electron micrograph of the mitochondrion itself. So now that we know that we can use DNA to study diversity or the relatedness of different organisms, and we know that we can get DNA from the mitochondria and, and lots and lots of copies of it. There's many copies of, of the mitochondrial DNA in each mitochondrion. So in fact, there's lots and lots of mitochondrial DNA in each cell. So all we're left with now is to isolate some mitochondrial DNA from some place. And in humans and in chimps, a very simple place to isolate DNA is from your mouth, the cells that are in the lining of your mouth and of your cheeks. We're changing them every day, we're replacing them. So they fall off pretty easily if you scrape them or just rinse your mouth out with some salt water as this young guy is doing here. And if you do that and look under a microscope, you'll see these flat pancake-like cells which are called squamous epithelial cells. And they really look exactly like that when you come out, they come out of your mouth. They're very simple, but remember, here's one cell here, here's another here. This is the nucleus of the cell. We can't see the mitochondria because they're much too small in this low powered picture. So anyway, I can rinse my mouth out with some salt water for 10 seconds. I can collect those cells. All I have to do is boil those cells for about 10 minutes and that breaks open the cells and the DNA comes spilling out of the mitochondria and also from the nucleus. So we can very easily get a crude extract of DNA in that way. Once we get the DNA out, we have to amplify it. So I'm gonna come back to this screen here, but I wanna show you a process through which we Amplify DNA. So here on my desktop, I have a little animation. We'll make it a little bigger here. So out of your mouth, we may get several hundred cheek cells. And from those several hundred cheek cells, we can get thousands of molecules of mitochondrial DNA to look at. But that's really not enough to analyze. So what we need to do is to do a process called polymerase chain reaction which will amplify one bit of the mitochondrial DNA that we want to look at. And in fact, we're only looking at several hundred rungs of the DNA ladder is all that we'll be looking at 
in this experiment. But we have to find a way to enrich or amplify that specific portion of the mitochondrial DNA. So here's the trick how we can do it. So this represents one bit of DNA. Let's say that bit of DNA that we want to analyze in our DNA study. First thing we do, and this represents one molecule of DNA, but in my test tube, the little test tube that I would be working with, there would be thousands of molecules like this all doing the same thing. So the first thing we do is we raise the temperature of this reaction, including the DNA, up to near boiling. And when we do that, the DNA comes apart into single strands. That's because the bonds that hold the middle of the DNA molecule together can't really withstand the energy that's in a hot, the hot liquid. So the DNA basically comes apart. Then if we lower the temperature, some small pieces of DNA called primers will come and find matches on the DNA molecule. So if we take a look back out at our DNA molecule, you can see that if I were to separate this molecule in half down the middle, that there's sort of a rule of DNA that the orange always goes with the green and the blue always goes with the red. Now those are chemicals called adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine, but there's a specific rule about how DNA pairs with each other. So if I separate this in half, I can send in a piece of DNA that recognizes this part here called a primer, and I can send in another primer here that will recognize a specific place on the DNA molecule. And then watch, once we have these primers that recognize and bracket the region we've like, we'd like to study, then we can do a chemical process to make lots of copies. So once the primers have found their match, we change the temperature, and an enzyme called polymerase comes in and rebuilds the DNA molecule by adding its complementary base pair or nucleotide. Let's try this again. Now we have two molecules where we once had one to begin with. We heat the DNA up to denature it into single strands. We add in the primers at another temperature, and then we extend new DNA molecules. Now we have four. In the third cycle, we repeat this all again. Hot temperature, low temperature, medium temperature. And even if you don't follow the chemistry that I said, the point is that as we go through these cycles of polymerase chain reaction, we start with one molecule and we end up with many, many copies of a specific part of the DNA that's delineated by the arrows. And that's the piece of DNA we're going to analyze in our experiment. Now, if you plot a graph of this, you can see that the DNA accumulates very quickly over time, logarithmically, 2, 4, 8, 16. This almost looks like the graph of the COVID infection because in fact it is logarithmic when it's going very quickly as it is now in the United States. But the point of it is if I do this experiment for 30 cycles of hot, cold, medium, after those 30 cycles, I will have up to a billion copies of each DNA molecule that I extracted from my cheek cells. And I do it in this little machine here, which is called a PCR machine or a DNA thermal cycle. Cycler, I have my cheek cell DNA and all the chemicals I need to replicate the DNA in this these tiny little test tubes. This would represent five samples. And I just close the lid, and this will take care of all of the cycling of the temperatures for me. I use some tools like micropipettes in the next session. I'll maybe show you a little bit more about these. But this machine does all the work. And to, do, to make lots and lots of copies of the mitochondrial DNA that we need in the experiment, it would take about an hour or an hour and 15 minutes in this machine.
Somehow I jumped through, sorry. Okay. Uh, now, once I have amplified the DNA to obtain the specific section of DNA, of mitochondrial DNA that we want to analyze, we put that in an envelope and we send it to a company or we send it to a DNA sequencing center anywhere that's set up to do this. They sequence the DNA to determine the exact arrangement of the rungs of the DNA ladder. I'll show you that experiment. And then it's sent back to us and automatically loaded into our database at a thing called bioservers, which I'm going to show you right now to do our analysis. So let's exit from this. And let me open up a website that I have here. So this is called bioservers. We designed it specifically so that students and the general public could analyze a bit of their own mitochondrial DNA. Uh, it was the first personal DNA project. We were doing this um, in the 1990s, long before there was anything like 23andMe or the Genographic uh, Project, or um, any of the other personal DNA uh, projects. So let me show you how this works. I'm gonna come into the part of bioservers called sequence servers, which deals with DNA sequence. Now it doesn't look like much now because it's just an empty desktop. So in order to do my analysis, I'm gonna to need to find some samples. So I can come in here and what I have here are groups of, of students that have done this experiment over the last couple months. And so first I'm gonna extract, uh, extract, extract some files of student DNA to look at. Now I just took a look at these to make sure everything was okay. And I need to find one here from Edmonds um, Community College. Where is it? I'm having trouble seeing it, right in the middle somewhere. Oh, here it is, okay, I forgot, there it is. Um, Edmonds Community College, if you don't know, happens to be north of Seattle, and I just choose this, chose this as a class. They did this experiment about a month ago. I'm gonna just say, okay, and now the students from Edmond, the samples of student DNA from Edmond uh, Community College are now loaded onto my workspace. Now, I don't know their names, but here's student number one, and I'll just pull up student number two. Before I compare them, I want you to show you, want to show you what DNA sequence looks like. So what you see at the top here is the actual output from the DNA sequencer. I don't know if you can maybe zoom in on that, maybe not. But what you'll see is each bar here, on top of each bar is a letter, and that's one of the four letters of the DNA code. And you can see that as I scroll through it, anytime you see this dark bar that's above the blue line, that means it's high quality sequence that we can readily analyze. And each one of these points on this graph, or electropharogram, represents one rung of the DNA ladder as it's determined by the DNA sequence experiment. And this is all very good sequence. I can sort of exaggerate this if I like by doing this. And now you'll see the peaks become taller. But the point of it is, as I scroll through from the beginning to the end, all of the sequence in this student's DNA sample is very high quality, which means I can do a very good analysis. And you'll see then it ends here and that's the end of the sequence. So that's a very good sequence that we can analyze. At the beginning of the sequence as well, there are ends, which means that the, the algorithm that is calling the rungs of the DNA ladder can't determine them at the beginning nor at the end, but that's normal. Uh, let me show you what it looks like when the DNA sequence is not perfect. I happen to have realized that student number three, unfortunately, their experiment didn't work very well. And look at the difference is the experiment looks very good up to about uh, 200 rungs of the DNA ladder or 200 nucleotides in. 
And then we have a problem where you'll see it becomes a mess. And this is a specific kind of a problem, but this represents pore sequence here that we really can't analyze. And if I blow it up a little bit, you'll see that the marks aren't distinct and different peaks are sort of on top of one another. Okay, so that's bad sequence. So let's come back. We're, not, we're gonna omit number three. And let's do a comparison between student number one and student number two at Edmonds uh, Community College near Seattle. And let's just see what we find. What this is, is this is an analysis that will take their sequences and align them or put them next to each other. Now, the way that we interpret this is here's the beginning part of the DNA sequence, which isn't any good. We come in until it looks clean without yellows or grays. And then we go through and here's student number one on the top and I mean, student number one on the top and student two on the bottom. And each line is 25 rungs of the DNA ladder that we can compare. And if we come in, we'll see that here is one difference here where student one has a C and student two has a, a T. And then it runs out, we have N's here so we don't count. But over about 400 or 350 rungs of the DNA ladder, these two students have only one difference. So just keep this in your mind as we count a couple of student samples. So student one to student two, just one difference in this part of the mitochondrial genome. Let's bring on another student here. Let's bring on student four or uh, four. And let's compare student number four to student number one and see what we come up with. Again, we have a problem in the beginning. We, we ignore that and we come into the sequence and we start to look for differences. And remember, each one of these is a mutation that has accumulated in different parts of the human lineage. Here's one difference, two difference, three differences. So in the first pair we did, there was one difference. In the second pair, three. Let's do another pair. Let's do student four versus student two. Run the alignment. This is called a sequence alignment because we're lining them up and we count one, two, three, four. So we've had between one and four differences between any of the students. Let's just pull up another student here. Let's try student number five, and let's compare student number five to student number two. Come into the sequence and count. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. We won't count that one there. So when we sampled any two of the students from Edmonds Community College, there were between one and five differences between those students. Let's now, let's now diverge and try another um, strategy, which is let's find some, some humans from databases so that we can extend our study outside of these students from Seattle to, to populations around the world. We'll keep our students here, but let's pull up some other populations. So I'll come here into a, into a database. Sorry, let me go back. And I'm going to pull up a different kind of sample here, which is modern human DNA. And here I see groups from Africa. I'll take them, groups from Asia, and groups from Europe. I think I'll just stop with there for now. I'm going to take those three different groups and move them into our workspace. So here's my workspace again. My students are now have moved down here. We've worked a bit with student number two. Let's leave student number two in the mix and let's compare student number two to a pygmy from Central Africa. This is a population group 
living in what is now the Congo. And so let's take a look at them. Here's the student from Seattle and the pygmy from the Aturi forest in Central Africa. Now, first off, we come into the sequence again. We ignore the mismatches in the beginning and we come in and here we see something very interesting. We see a bunch of dashes here. And what this means is that the pygmies have a region that's deleted. This probably all happened at once where these rungs of the DNA ladder were removed at once. So we're gonna count that only as one mutation, but it's sort of a special one. But let's just count it as one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and I think I'll count one of those, nine. So something like eight or nine mutations between the pygmy and student number two. Let's try a different African group, which are the Yorubans from West Africa. Let's do a student number two versus a West African. Again, we come into the sequence and here we see one, two, three, three differences. Let's compare the Yoruban to the pygmy, two African groups, but widely separated on the African continent. There's that deletion, we count that as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's branch out and try something totally different. Let's try student number two versus a person from Japan. Come into the sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's try student number two versus a person from Europe. Let's try someone from Germany. This sequence is not good, so let's come into it. One, two, three, Four. That one was a little shorter, so it biases our work a little bit. Let's try a different one. Let's try, um, let's try from Finland. Overall, we're trying to compare about 400 or 375 rungs, and then everything is the same. These are not so good. The Finnish one also is quite short, this sequence, so some of these sequences are shorter because they were, the experiment was done in a different way. And let's just try um, one more European here. Let's try Greece, see if that's a little bit better. Yes, that's better. So you see, we don't have that yellow area in the beginning, it's much smaller. So let's compare student two versus Greece. One difference. Now, we could continue on and do lots and lots of comparisons, two-way comparisons between any two people uh, on the globe. Uh, we could do hundreds, we could do thousands. The interesting thing is we could do more and more and more, but the picture would be pretty much the same, that we would see somewhere between zero, which is possible, zero differences, up to maybe 10 or 12. But if you take the average of this experiment, if you do it lots of times, and I've done it a lot of times, and professionals have done it a lot of times, the average number of differences in this part of the mitochondrial DNA between any two people on the globe is about seven differences. And we were more or less in that region. We have some students that were less than seven. We had some matches that were more than seven. But you could get the number. Even if you don't like seven, you might say four, or you might say 10. But probably less than 10, you would agree, would be the average that we could come up with, okay? So keep that number in mind, and keep the look of what we did in mind, because now we're gonna do the chimpanzees. I'm just going to erase all of these 
things and get them off of my workspace. I'm going to come in here and find some chimpanzees. So here's non-human mitochondrial DNA, and I have a group here which are primates, which include the chimps. So let me open that up. So now I have some chimpanzees, more or less from across the range of chimps from West Africa to East Africa. I don't have a great representation of all of them, but let's just take a look at some. Here's a chimpanzee from West Africa, and let's take a chimpanzee from East Africa, which is Tanzania. Gombe Stream is where um, a lot of work has been done on chimpanzees by the famous primatologist called Jane Goodall. She had her site at Gombe Stream Reservoir. So maybe this is one of Jane Goodall's chimpanzees. Let's compare the one from West Africa with the one from East Africa. We're doing this alignment between the DNA, and here we go. Here's a part that doesn't match, so let's not count that, but let's come into the sequence. This gray one means there's a problem with the sequence, so we will also not count that. But let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. I might have missed some because I'm having a hard time seeing my screen. Maybe I'll make it a little brighter. So it was uh, 29 or 30 differences. Is there a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm making it a little bigger, thank you. Okay, so we did our first experiment between an Eastern and a Western chimpanzee, and there were 29 or 30 differences. We don't have to worry too much about the exact number. Let's try the Western chimpanzee versus uh, a central chimpanzee. This is a chimpanzee from the same region of Africa as the pygmy a human that we investigated earlier. There's no relationship, but it's just interesting. So let's now look at the Western chimpanzee and the central chimpanzee. Thank you for telling me to enlarge this. Here's the number of differences. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41. Okay, so we had 30 in the first sample, 41 in the next pair. Let's compare two, chimp two, pan two chimpanzees from West Africa. So number one and number three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty, or thirty-one. So again, if we wanted to be rigorous, we could compare hundreds or thousands of chimpanzees in pairs from all over their range in Africa. But I think you get the point that it looks like there's somewhere around 30 or even more different mutations or DNA differences between any two chimpanzees. So I have trouble finding my uh, thing up here. I can't, oh, there it is, okay. So let's come back to my talk here and let's finish up and see if we can solve this riddle.
So if I were now going to take these two groups of living organisms, humans and chimps, say at some point long, long ago, about eight million years, seven or eight million years, uh, we had a common ancestor and then we diverged and mutations started to accumulate in our lineage. Then you might say that over the time since we had a common ancestor, about seven mutations accumulated on average between any two people. And that sort of represents the diversity in this genetic system, because there's other genetic systems. But the extent of the human diversity between any two humans is about seven mutations. But what's the extent of the differences between chimps? It's somewhere like 30 or more mutations. So now it, we be, began this exercise by looking at chimps who for all intents and purposes look identical to each other so far as where they come from. And we looked at humans who looked rather different depending where on the globe they come from. But what we found here is that genetically, chimps have much more genetic variation than do humans. So if we represented our samples down here, these twisted pipe cleaners have lots of different mutations in chimps and relatively few different mutations in humans. Well, let's come back to our experiment. Remember I showed you this experiment where they did what I did, but with hundreds of human beings and hundreds of chimps. But they did it identically to the way that I showed you. And what did they find out? Here's this big tree. Here's the common ancestor. It's a more complicated tree because it's shaped sort of like a circle. But here's the common ancestor of everybody, all the organisms in this study. And the question is, where are the humans and where are the chimps? Well, here's the answer. All of these branches, which are mean all differences, are concentrated in the chimpanzees. And the small number of differences that can be found in humans are represented by those branches. So this is exactly what we saw with our eyes, which is chimpanzees have much more genetic diversity, several times more than human beings. And as a matter of fact, remember when we looked at those two Western chimps, where there were 30 differences between the Western chimps? So especially the Western chimps are really diverse. And do you see these boxes here, the black boxes and the open boxes? Those are Western chimpanzees of two different social groups. And what you'll see, if you look at the black ones, for example, there's more genetic diversity between the chimps of one Western chimpanzee social group than there are in all of the modern humans alive today. And that gives you an idea of the extent of the genetic diversity of chimps. So why is that? Remember, chimps mainly live in dense equatorial rainforests, okay? And those equatorial rainforests are now located in the green areas in Western, Central, and Eastern Africa. However, several million years ago, that rainforest extended entirely across a belt of Africa and even more to the north and to the south. We know that by other kinds of evidence of, of uh, fossilized plants and so forth. And over time, that rainforest has shrunk because chimps once ranged millions of years ago all across Central Africa. And as the climate changed, the rainforest thinned out into these scattered areas and gave us these Western, Central, and Eastern chimps. And as a matter of fact, they're so different one from another that there, some people recognize them as three or four different subspecies because they've differentiated genetically as their range was fragmented. Well, this is what happened about two and a half million years ago. Africa became drier and the rainforest began to segment, and that's what separated the subspecies of chimpanzees. 
And then there's dramatic evidence of grazing animals coming into Africa and into Central Africa, into the grasslands of Africa about two and a half million years ago. And this is also where we find many of the ancient humans that we'll study in upcoming sessions of this program. So there's the savanna of Africa that borders on the rainforest. It's rich in all kinds of animals. But remember, the chimps, although they spend much of their time in the trees, do sometimes venture out into the grass areas surrounding the forest. And that's exactly what our ancient ancestors did when they evolved in Africa for life on the grassy plains. And in the next episode, we'll study the movement of those ancient people out of Africa to people to populate all of the known world. And that's what gave humans their distinctive looks and distinctive cultures, is as they came out of Africa and faced new climates and new challenges, the exterior of their body and their customs for dealing with the world changed. And next episode, we'll begin with this ancient ancestor, Homo erectus, who came out of Afri the African plain about two million years ago and populated Asia and Europe. And we're gonna find out how this and other ancient hominids are related to 